All right, well, I see that Facebook's live's up, so we'll start. Um, this is Brad Keithley. I'm uh, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, which is a state group focused on primarily on state fiscal issues, but also uh, am privileged to work with uh, uh, Bill and others at the Concord Coalition uh, in following federal issues as well. We're honored and pleased to be able to co-host this event uh, with the uh, Concord Coalition to, as we put it in our promo materials, bring DC to Alaska uh, and talk about uh, some very serious, very serious fiscal issues that we're facing at, at the federal level. We have our own at the state level as well, but uh, reading the CBO's 30-year outlook yesterday, I, they're, they're sort of dwarfed uh, in a way by, uh, by those at the federal issue, federal level. So thank you for joining us here in Alaska, uh, and thank you for taking the time to, 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 to you know, be part of this. Uh, and let me turn it over to Phil uh, Smith to talk about it from the Concord Coalition uh, standpoint. Well, Brad, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the work you do as a fiscal lookout for the Concord Coalition in the state of Alaska, uh, including hosting this event today. And uh, we also have several guests uh, on with us today. There's, I, I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, look at every single guest and, and uh, call them out, but there is one fellow that I'd like to say hello to from Florida, and that's Noah Jenkins who's joining us. Noah is our youth ambassador for the Concord Coalition, and he recently gave uh, a speech on uh, fiscal issues to his high school. He's an 11th grader uh, down in the Sunshine State. So, uh, Brad, we've got the whole country covered today, all the way from Florida to Alaska, and, and several folks joining us from, from in between, as well as a great number of Alaskans on, on this today. So, thank you, each of you, for joining us. We've got a really interesting program uh, for you lined up today. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is kind of jump right into the program and introduce our national policy director of the Concord Coalition, Tori Gorman. Uh, Tori has a terrific background in history. Uh, she's worked for over 16 years on Capitol Hill, where she's held director level positions, advising senior members of the budget appropriations and tax writing committees uh, in both the House and Senate. So we like to say that Tori is bipartisan and bicameral. Uh, she has uh, worked on a num number of issue areas, uh, budget process, entitlement, and tax reforms. Um, all of this have helped to establish her incredible reputation uh, for bipartisanship and fiscal responsibility. Prior to her work um, in the, at the federal level, Tori was an economist for the Maryland General Assembly, and she holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in applied economics and finance from the University of California you see at Santa Cruz, um, where I like to always remind people that's the home of the famous banana slugs. So Tori, uh, without further ado, if you would take it away. Thank you, thanks so much for that, uh, for that introduction, Phil, I appreciate it. Sorry, I had a message pop up on my screen. Um, to facilitate the conversation today, I put together a little slideshow. Uh, wow, okay, so there we go. Um, so today we're going to talk about the federal fiscal response to the coronavirus. And uh, before I dive into details on the federal response, I think it's important to provide some context for where we are. Um, we're in the midst of an unprecedented public health crisis uh, in order to save hundreds of thousands of American lives. Large sectors of our economy were placed in a self-induced coma where many remain today. Um, over 29 million people are collecting some form of unemployment insurance. The unemployment rate for August, as reported in the beginning of September, was 8.4%. This is down significantly from the peak of 14.7% in April, but employment is still historically very high. Um, just to give you some perspective, unemployment during the Great Recession peaked at 10.6%. And so we're not very far away from that today. Uh, in fact, a recession has already been declared. Uh, first quarter real GDP this year contracted by 5% from the previous quarter. And the second quarter contracted by double that amount. In fact, if this, the second quarter contraction was so steep that if it persisted, the domestic economy would lose about one third of its value over the course uh, of a year. Adding to this sobering climate, 
uh, it's no secret that the federal government entered this crisis with a terrible, terrible balance sheet. Um, instead of spending the last decade uh, of recovery after the Great Recession, paying down our debt or addressing the structural imbalance in our major entitlement programs, uh, Washington lawmakers have been increasing spending and cutting taxes. And as a result, despite a, 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 almost a decade of relative peace and prosperity, our budget deficits have been rising rather than shrinking. Now, with that said, in a global crisis such as the one we now face, uh, it is inevitable and it is appropriate that our federal government run, run uh, big deficits. Uh, I say this because we can't deny the simple fact and that is that our economy and by consequence the federal budget will never recover if Americans don't feel safe. So with that introduction, how has Congress and the president responded so far? So today, uh, lawmakers in Washington have enacted four pieces of legislation. First, on March 6th, Congress passed an $8 billion emergency supplemental appropriation bill, which contained money for things like vaccine development, disease surveillance, uh, the acquisition of medical supplies, more medical lab capacity, but also to expand Medicare telehealth services for senior citizens so they could see their physicians and the safety of their home. Uh, less than two weeks later, Congress passed a second package. Uh, this was called the Family First Act. And this bill focused on the plight of workers who might be affected by the coronavirus, either because they themselves had to self quarantine and could not go to work, um, or because they had to stay home and take care of somebody who was sick. And what that bill did is it provided approximately $200 billion in payroll tax credits that were supposed to help incentivize small businesses to provide their employees with paid sick leave for absences that were related to the coronavirus. Um, it also uh, in included provisions uh, stipulating that all federal health care programs were required to provide beneficiaries with access to no cost coronavirus testing. So nine days after the Family First Act became law, then Congress passed the CARES Act, which was a $1.7 trillion rescue mission designed to provide an economic lifeline uh, for those individuals who could not work and for those businesses that could not operate during the pandemic. It spent a lot of money, obviously, and unfortunately, I don't have time within uh, our, our, our framework today to review it all, but I would like to, oops, excuse me, jumping ahead here, uh, well, give you some highlights. We'll get to the fourth bill there in a second. Um, first, the CARES Act on the big circle there. It provided- Hey, hey Tori, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think you still need to hit share screen down at the bottom real quick. I'm really sorry. You guys are missing all the fun. No, no, that's right. I thought I loved it because really we were paying so close attention to you. I was, uh, and, and, but as soon as you said that one chart, I was like, oh, I bet she wants a chart with that one. Okay, so here's the, well, let me just preface right here by saying, let me go back a slide. This is uh, how we entered uh, the coronavirus right here with enormous levels of debt. And how has Congress responded so far? They passed one small bill, an $8 billion bill, a $200 billion bill, and then the $1.7 trillion coronavirus. And here I was starting to tell you a little bit about it. So my apologies for the technology. No worries. Um, all right, so the CARES Act, uh, it provided about uh, $1,200 direct cash subsidies called recovery rebates to individuals and families at a cost of about 300 billion. It also included about $265 billion to expand and enhance unemployment insurance. For example, the CARES Act temporarily provided unemployment insurance coverage for workers who were previously not eligible to receive uh, that type of coverage. Uh, people like independent contractors, uh, the self-employed, gig economy workers, and more. So uh, as a consequence of the CARES Act, they're now eligible to receive um, uh, unemployment insurance temporarily. Um, also, up until July 31st, unemployed workers received an extra $600 per week in their unemployment and checks. Um, that was an effort to improve the ability of unemployment insurance to more fully replace lost wages. The idea being if government is going to tell you, you need to not go to work, you need to stay home, businesses, you need to close, 
uh, you know, traditionally unemployment insurance only covers about 45, 46% of wages lost. If government's going to tell you you need to stay home, uh, the feeling was that that government needed to help make that make your your income level whole. Um, the CARES Act also included about $377 billion in what's called a new Paycheck Protection Program, which is a really interesting federal loan forgiveness program for small businesses uh, designed to help them cover payroll and uh, rent, mortgage, utilities uh, during the crisis. And the interesting thing about those loans is that uh, they will be forgiven if recipients can demonstrate that they kept their employees on payroll subject to certain conditions. Um, the Tar CARES Act also included a number of tax breaks for businesses to, uh, to improve their cash flow. And it also included $150 billion uh, in, a, in a public health fund for state and local governments to help them cover the costs they incurred in dealing with the coronavirus. Think about um, a local county uh, public health agency that has to set up a mobile testing site, for example, or a walk-up site, or has to purchase PPE for its employees or, or for residents of their, of their locality. So that fund is designed to cover those expenses. So in the span of three weeks, if you're looking here at this graph, from March 6th to March 27th, Congress threw nearly $2 trillion at the coronavirus. Um, the fourth bill, took a little bit uh, longer to materialize, but it was another expensive package, nearly uh, half trillion dollars. And the cornerstone of that was about 320 billion to recapitalize the Small Business Paycheck Protection Act, which had actually exhausted its funds by then. And then there was another hundred billion dollars in there for uh, healthcare providers. So let's zoom out uh, from this detail and let's take a broader look at how the coronavirus relief funds in those four bills were allocated across people and things. Um, this pie chart illustrates in four broad categories where the COVID money has gone. Um, and I would like to point out that this slide includes both spending and tax cuts. Um, the blue slice shows you that the bulk of the money through all four coronavirus relief bills, 59% of it, or 1.4 trillion, was distributed to business institutions as well as state and local governments. And this slice, it, it illustrates the, the clearly the priority and the strategy of Congress in passing the, these bills, uh, which was basically to do everything that they could to maintain the bond between the employee and the employer during a crisis in the hopes that when it was safe to do so, everyone could go back to the jobs that they had before the pandemic hit thus increasing the probability of a, of a V-shaped recovery um, between the Paycheck Protection Program, the Employee Retention uh, Payroll Tax Credits, and a number of other uh, temporary tax measures were all designed to increase cash on hand. Um, so lawmakers invested huge sums of money uh, to provide a bridge for businesses unable to operate during the pandemic and to keep their employees on board. The next largest pot of money, the red slice there, 27% or $640 billion went to individuals and households, largely in the form of one-time income tax rebates. We talked about the recovery rebates and unemployment insurance. Um, this bucket, actually, the red pie here, uh, has received a lot of attention as lawmaker, lawmakers debated a, a fifth pandemic relief bill. Um, for example, extending uh, the pandemic uh, unemployment insurance, the $600 per week, has been very controversial as the unemployment rate has fallen. But there's also some concern that as businesses affect, affected by the coronavirus exhaust uh, their reserves and federal loans, that unemployment may rise again. So you can see how that uh, is generating um, some controversy. The green slice represents all the funding that went towards medical care and research, about $335 billion. Again, things like vaccine development, expanding lab capacity, aid to frontline health workers, expanding Medicare telehealth benefits, but also expanding access and, and increased federal financial support to states for programs like Medicaid and uh, the state children's health insurance program. What I found remarkable about this slide when I put it together and did the arithmetic was that only a very small portion of the money, about $8 billion, and that little teeny tiny purple sliver there actually went to federal agencies for administrative expenses. I know we like to think that there's a lot of waste uh, in the federal government, but at least at this, it, it, with these four bills in terms of overhead, I'm not saying that there hasn't been waste in things like the Paycheck Protection Program and things like that, um, but at least in terms of overhead, you know, very little actually went to the federal government and the, the agencies that are responsible 
uh, for, for, for running several of these programs. And most of that money went to the Small Business Administration to hire more people so that it could process the, the Paycheck Protection Program loans uh, faster. So if you recall, you know, before we got into this, this deep dive into the coronavirus relief packages, um, we started this by looking at a slide on the debt that our nation carried into the crisis. Um, so where are we now after we've spent $2.4 trillion on the coronavirus? Let's look at deficits first. Um, so deficits, this, these are the, the deficits are the annual budget deficits, the difference between how much money the government spends every year and how much it collects in terms of revenue. Um, in March of this year, before the pandemic made its presence known here uh, in the United States, the Congressional Budget Office projected that the federal government would incur a trillion dollar deficit this year, next year, and in every year of the 10 year budget window. It is not looking pretty. Um, after enacting four pandemic relief bills uh, and appropriating $2.4 trillion in their September update, uh, just last week, uh, CBO reported that it now expects the current year deficit in fiscal 20, which ends at the end, fiscal 20 ends at the end of this month, September 30th. The deficit they're expecting for this year is now three times, three times larger than what they were expecting in March. Uh, so instead of a $1.1 trillion deficit, they're looking at 3.3. And next year's deficit uh, will be double from 1 trillion, almost double, I should say, from 1 trillion to 1.8. And I'd like to point out that that's only if Congress doesn't do anything. If they close up their offices and go home for the next year. Um, if they enact another pandemic relief bill before the end of this fiscal year uh, or next year, then those deficits are gonna grow. Um, when you look further out into the future, uh, the deficit effects of the pandemic eventually do wane. And you can see that in the graph here, we go from $3.3 trillion deficit in 2020 uh, back down to 1.3, 1.1 trillion, excuse me, in 2023. Um, but the underlying structural imbalance between revenues and spending that we had before we entered this crisis still remains. So as a consequence, budget deficits begin to grow again. Uh, and you're looking at deficits that exceed a trillion dollars in every year of the budget window. So let's look at debt. Um, a former Senate colleague of mine, his name is Brian Riedel, he's with the Manhattan Institute. Uh, he likes to say that the coronavirus has produced three crises, uh, a health crisis, an economic crisis because of everything we had to shut down, but also a third crisis, which was the price of addressing the first two, a federal debt crisis. And the recent budget update from the Congressional Budget Office illustrates this. Um, when you measure debt as a percentage of GDP, which is something economists like to do a lot, um, because it allows us to compare spending and debt and deficits across time without worrying about any distortion created by inflation. So when you look at, at debt uh, uh, as a, a debt held by the public, okay, so this is not Social Security debt, this is not debt we owe Medicare, this is debt that's held by the public, tradable on the open markets, will rise sharply from 79% of GDP in 2019 uh, to 98% of GDP in 2020. So in a few short weeks, we're gonna close this fiscal year with practically uh, enough debt equal to the size of our economy. Um, uh, and by, let's see, let's see, by the end of 2021, uh, debt held by the public will exceed 100% of GDP, granting the United States access to the unenviable club of nations with debt loads that exceed the size of their economies. And by 2023, CBO predicts that debt held by the public will reach an ominous new record of 107% of GDP, higher than it ever was after World War II. And absent any legislative fixes or unforeseen economic booms, debt to GDP will climb even further to 109% of GDP by 2030, which is the end of the, the, the budget window that, that Congress deals with. Jory, may I ask the question? Uh, sure, Tejas. What you know, you're projecting going to 109 percent. That actually is a relatively flat growth. What growth rate do you expect? What GDP growth is projected here? What percentage GDP growth is projected between 2020 and 2030? 
I don't know the exact numbers. I'm thinking it's probably somewhere around 2% just because of, of population growth and productivity. Pop, you know, our population is not growing very fast and, and there aren't any uh, real drivers of, of productivity. So I don't have CBO's numbers in front of me, but I'm thinking it's about 2% of GDP. Once you yeah, My guess is that if it is 2%, that in reality, I think by 2030, actually, I think that the answer of 109%, I would, I would think it would be even, it would be much higher. Well, I, you make a good point there because one of the assumptions that CBO makes is that this, they call this what they call it is a current law baseline. So it's an, as if laws are written right now, spend, spending and, and revenue laws. And a couple of things uh, implied in here, number one, is the Trump tax cuts uh, in 2017, a good chunk of the individual tax cuts were temporary. Right. So as part of this forecast, CBO assumes, yeah, they're temporary, which means they're going to expire in 2025. I think we all know that that's not going to happen. Um, so the numbers here are actually going to be higher. And again, this assumes that Congress doesn't pass any more legislation. Right. The president uh, in November, who's going to have an entirely new uh, 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 economic plan, and it might involve more spending. So you're right. Thanks. So, um, all right, let me move forward here real quick. So we talked about four pandemic relief uh, bills. The question is, is whether there's going to be a fifth. Um, honestly, I don't know. If I had given you this presentation uh, at the end of July, I would have said, oh, absolutely. There's no way Congress would go home for the August recess without passing another pandemic relief bill. And if you had asked me at the beginning of September, I would have said, oh, absolutely. There's no way that the House and the Senate are going to go home and campaign for reelection without passing another pandemic relief bill. Um, and here we said uh, the House and the Senate are about ready to leave and we haven't passed another piece of legislation yet. Um, what I do know, uh, aside from the fact that there is no agreement, is that the two chambers are very far apart. Lots of areas of disagreement. They disagree on unemployment insurance. They disagree on aid to, aid to state and local governments. They disagree on school funding. They disagree on what to do about coronavirus in the workplace. Uh, the House wants to pass OSHA standards and protect the employees. The Senate bill uh, has safe harbors to protect employers from litigation. Um, rebate checks. Um, this, the House obviously wants to, to um, issue another set of recovery rebates. Frankly, the Senate can't make up its mind what it wants to do. It's been all over the map on whether or not to issue another set of rebate checks. Food aid. The House provides uh, more aid for uh, individuals who are impoverished and uh, food insecure. The Senate bill provides $20 billion for farmers. Um, Paycheck Protection Act. They both take a different approach there. Um, and then just on the top line alone, uh, this House bill uh, is $3.4 trillion versus the Senate, the most recent version. Um, the, 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 the net cost of the Senate bill is about $300 billion, but that obscures about $350 billion in rescissions that they then repurpose and spend elsewhere. So um, that's where we are on whether or not there's a fifth package. So the question with all of this, you guys know who Concord Coalition is, all right? Where have we been in this debate? Um, first of all, let me say that Concord Coalition is a nonprofit think tank. We aren't lobbyists and we don't have a PAC. So uh, our goal instead is to educate. Um, we'll educate anybody who speaks to it or listens to us. I mean, we'll educate members of Congress, uh, we'll, we'll educate voters, we'll educate anybody who listens. Um, all along, uh, the Concord Coalition has advised Congress to pursue pandemic relief um, that follows what we call the three T's, uh, relief that is timely and targeted and temporary. So what do we mean timely? We mean benefits, um, proposals uh, that uh, 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 where a stimulate the, the benefits uh, the stimulus package must be capable of producing benefits while the economy is weak not after the crisis has passed. So to give you an example, we think that Congress should resist the temptation to add expensive, long horizon highway infrastructure proposals or permanent healthcare benefits to emergency legislation that's designed for speed and not necessarily deliberation. Um, targeted, Congress is, or the Concord Coalition has argued uh, that, that relief should be targeted. Um, it's been said, <laughs> with derision, appropriate, that Congress never lets a crisis go to waste. Uh, the temptation is always to pad must-pass legislation with pet projects, new entitlement benefits, 
permanent tax cuts, uh, major spending programs that go beyond the scope of, 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 of the crisis. And that propensity cuts across both parties. There's not one party that owns the corner on this. Um, Concord has advocated for a well-designed stimulus that steers federal dollars only to those households and businesses that are most directly affected by the pandemic and deploying solutions that help smooth cash flow until the economy recovers. So that's timely and that's targeted. What about temporary? Um, with nearly 27 trillion in existing gross debt today and almost 6 trillion of that belongs to social security uh, and projections of deficits as far as the eye can see. Uh, Concord Coalition believes that it is imperative that any stimulus and package include an expiration date and that Congress adhere to it uh, unless uh, the situation merits otherwise. So that's what we've been advocating for. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here talking to you. So if you want to help, and this is where I'm gonna wrap up my conversation here and let open the floor up for questions. If you wanna help the Concord Coalition, um, echo our message in your communities and on your favorite social media platforms. Um, in addition to our website, which is there on the screen, you can find Concord Coalition on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, from our website, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, it's free. <laughs> um, it's called The Lookout, which includes all kinds of budget related information and links and rel re related stories, as well as our own original analyses. It comes out uh, on a weekly basis, usually Thursdays. Um, you can also subscribe to our podcast. Uh, Concord Coalition produces, actually, this is really, we're really proud of this. We have the number one public policy podcast called Facing the Future. It's hosted by our own uh, Chase Hageman, um, and new episodes are available uh, every week. So lastly, um, I would ask you to please consider asking the Concord Coalition to host future events like this one uh, in your community. Um, Phil Smith, who you met at the opening of our discussion today, is our national field director, and he can speak to you uh, about other budget exercises that uh, that Concord Coalition has and other chart talks that we have. We can't we can talk about more than just how we've responded to uh, the coronavirus pandemic, um, and Phil can talk to you more about some of the products that we offer. So. Um, I think at that point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it back to uh, Phil and again say thank you for letting me know that I had not shared my screen because all I could see on my screen was my slideshow. So No thank worries. You. Now, Tori, thank you so much. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, it was timely, uh, temporary, and targeted. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so job, job well done. And uh, I, I would like, like to echo uh, Tori's comments about our podcast and our newsletter. Hopefully you guys, most of the people on this call may be receiving it already. If not, please go to our, our website at concordcoalition.org and sign up. Um, uh, we have fiscal lookouts on the call from not just Alaska where uh, Brad is, but um, being a fiscal lookout and a volunteer for the Concord Coalition is such an important job for us because you're looking out for opportunities for us just like this. So the presentation that we had today, we try to keep it brief. So as you saw, this is sort of like the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club presentation where we get it done in, in about 20 to 25 minutes and then have time for Q&A, which we still have that coming up. But I just wanted to jump in real quick and and let you know some of the other things that you can do. Follow us on social media, obviously, on uh, Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube. And um, also we have our federal budget exercise and we do that on college campuses, but also in other environments. So sometimes chambers of commerce like to sponsor this. Um, I know that we um, have a guest from the Alaska chamber today. Oftentimes we've worked with chambers uh, and academic institutions to run our budget exercise. That takes a little bit longer. It's about a two hour long event. And in that session, people pretend like they're a policymaker, a member of Congress, and they're grouped up into small groups uh, and we do all this virtually now right here on Zoom with the subgroupings. And uh, basically people assemble their own 10 year federal budget. And it's very instructive and it helps people learn where the big changes are in the budget, where the growth is in the budget. And it makes people realize that it's not quite as easy as they thought, right? That they thought that, oh, I wish their Congress, I wish my Congressman would just vote the right way and get this done. But once you start digging into the numbers, you realize it's, it's actually a pretty big challenge, um, but it is doable. And oftentimes the groups succeed 
at putting together a fiscally responsible 10-year budget. So that's a couple things we do. Again, these presentations, the budget exercises, if, you're, if your local civic club, Rotary or Kiwanis is looking for a speaker, please let us know. Um, but I wanna cut that off there and, um, and ask if there's any questions uh, for Tori or for me or for Brad. Uh, we'll be happy to entertain that here in the, the last section of today's call. So uh, Brad, I'll turn it back over to you and, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, I have, let me take the, the privilege of the first question, uh, Tori, from the Alaska perspective. Our economy is really built on three things. It's built on oil, prices down. It's built on tourism, of which there was not much, if any, this summer. Uh, and it's built on fish, which frankly depends largely, we're coming to realize, on restaurants being open. Um, and, and that hasn't uh, gone very well. So at the Alaska Chamber presentation this morning on, on, our, on the state of our economy this morning, there was this fairly long presentation about how deep a hole we're in uh, and how difficult it's going to climb out, be to climb out of the hole, but some positive uh, 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 feel out of that, that uh, you know, we'll get back to tourism. It's not going to be as great, but we'll get back to tourism oil at least isn't dropping any further. Restaurants are opening, fishes, fish will be okay. And then with the caveat at the end, of course, that all assumes that we get additional federal aid <laughs> to help us over the rough, rough patch. So uh, uh, the Alaskans would be partic were particularly interested, I think, in your discussion of the next COVID relief bill and, um, and, and the prospects for that. I know your response was, or I know your statement was, uh, you don't know, but can you give us some feel for the drivers behind uh, uh, the potential for a pre-election COVID re relief bill? And then maybe through the election, you know, it depends on who's elected, but through the election, what it looks like uh, maybe in the lame duck or maybe at the first part of the next Congress uh, about dealing with uh, COVID relief? As far as any opportunity for legislation between now and election, I just don't see it, especially with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Trump administration moving ahead on a Supreme Court nomination. I just think that has poisoned the well so deeply at this point. I really don't see any opportunities for legislation, especially um, when you take a look at the, the Senate. Um, they're, they're, uh, I don't think there's any legislation that can pass through the Senate right now. I mean, we, we've ditched the filibuster on um, the executive calendar, uh, but we still have a legislative filibuster, which means for most things you need 60 votes to go forward. Um, and that's just not going to happen. The Republicans have a different uh, viewpoint of what the economy needs than what Democrats need. Um, and we've got a president who doesn't know where he is on, on pandemic relief. Uh, one day he's for it, one day he's against it, the next day he's for it in a really big way. Um, so I really just don't see any opportunities for any legislation before the election. Um, after the election, uh, we obviously, so one of the things that Congress has to do every year is pass 12 annual appropriation bills to fund the various federal agencies. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, there'll be, I hope, a continuing resolution at the end of this month to fund us past the November election. And then at that point, uh, depending upon the outcome of the November election, whether we have a new president or not, and whether or not the Senate switches hands or not, we'll determine whether or not there are votes to sort of do our, our homework, uh, you know, cram it in before the Christmas holiday. And, you know, when the, the rule of, of, of politics, one of the rules, there are many, um, is that if the train is leaving the station, meaning if active legislation is, is, is moving and is going to get to the president's desk, you want to be damn sure you get your stuff on the train. So it's quite possible um, especially as I was alluding to in my presentation, as the, the relief that they've already passed so far uh, in the first four bills, um, uh, those reserves uh, are, are spent and uh, uh, maybe there's a, a, another spike in coronavirus and, and it's the wintertime months and uh, uh, you know, we're, we're hunkering down more and more inside of our homes, the need for uh, financial assistance um, uh, is, is enhanced and there's more uh, political support for a fifth pandemic relief bill. Um, I will say, um, this is my own personal opinion, I don't think I'm representing the Concord Coalition when I say this, I think one of the most short-sighted things uh, that Senate Republicans have done was to say no to extending any form of unemployment insurance for a variety of reasons. Um, 
number one, I just I think uh, we have a responsibility to keep people whole, but two, just from a, 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 a social cohesion uh, uh, responsibility. And then also, I, I, I know that Senate Republicans aren't really enamored with uh, appropriating money for state and local governments. Um, unemployment insurance benefits are taxable. And for many months during the summer, those extended those uh, extra six hundred dollar per week unemployment insurance benefits were keeping uh, st state budgets and local uh, county bu budgets uh, from blowing huge. I mean, yes, there's been shortages, um, but they were initially, uh, you know, the National Governors Association at the beginning of the summer was actually asking for something around five hundred billion dollars in in relief for state and local governments. Um, you know, we've seen over the past couple of months that they don't probably don't need that much. Do they need a couple hundred billion dollars? Yes, they do, um, but they don't need 500 billion. Um, so I think uh, not extending um, unemployment insurance was just so short-sighted in so many ways. It's been so helpful in propping up the economy over the summer and all the other things that, that, that I've spoken about. So it's my hope that uh, uh, when we get around to talking about a fifth pandemic relief bill in the, the November, December timeframe, that that'll definitely be part of the conversation. One more follow up on that. Um, from, in, from the Alaska perspective, there was some discussion during the chamber meeting this morning about the $300 uh, uh, FEMA aid that's, uh, that's coming through in the form of additional uh, pay or uh, unemployment relief. But, but there's, not a, there's not a realization, I don't think, about the limited nature of that $300. Alaska is one of the states that qualified sort of halfway through. Uh, and so we're still seeing the $300 or it's coming to us uh, uh, fairly soon. But uh, you, if you could just take a second and speak to the limited nature of that additional, of that additional amount. So the, the $300 per week that Brad's talking about is, uh, it's extra unemployment insurance that the Trump administration implemented by executive order. And what they're doing is they're taking economic injury disaster loans from FEMA um, and using that to provide states with $300 per week uh, uh, unemployment insurance benefits. That fund, the EIDL, um, is is finite. That is a finite amount of money. And when that money runs out, so do the benefits. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly when that's supposed to, to run out, um, but I'm, I'm trying to remember how much it had in it. I think it was only about $20 billion, uh, but I, I could be wrong. Um, but it is a finite amount of money that's appropriated by Congress. And in order to backfill uh, any more money or to put any more money into that account, we would need another appropriation from Congress, which means it has to go through the House, through the Senate, and be signed by the President. And as I stipulated before, I just I think the 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 environment for legislating between now and November is is non-existent. I've got one wrap-up question, but uh, we've got time for a couple others. If anybody want to wants to ask before uh, before we we go to the wrap-up. <laughs> well, you, you've, you've stunned everybody. Oh, Alan, go ahead. Impact on inflation. Oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll interpret. So during this morning's, um, oh, no video. Okay. So during this morning's uh, Alaska Chamber presentation, uh, we got to, we were talking about um, the, uh, the, the amount of debt uh, that's being issued, the amount of federal debt that's being issued. Uh, and, and not only the, the amount of debt when you look at the 10 year window, but when you start looking at the 30 year window, the amount of, the amount of additional debt and, and, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cumulative impact of the, on that. Um, and it, on, on the radio show this morning, I was talking about that's all hanging. I mean, the fact that people say that's not gonna you know, derail the US is all hanging on this single thread of low interest rates uh, and, and low, uh, low inflation rates. Alan's question this morning at the Alaska Chamber was, what, what outlook do you see for inflation? Do you, do, do we, are we anticipating inflation staying low, interest rates staying low, or are we expecting this amount of, of money that's being pumped into our economy, both by the, the legislative branch and the Fed, uh, to start uh, ratcheting up interest rates at some point? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, the... Sorry. Um, 
So the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, Chairman Jerome Powell has said that he will keep uh, uh, interest rates low and let inflation rise if, if need be. Um, uh, I think one reason, I mean, so it's, Concord Coalition occupies a really tough place right now because we're very, very concerned about our debt and deficits and we're reaching levels of, of debt and deficits that have been have, have, have created crises in other countries. For example, the, 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 the um, interest spiral, the debt spiral in Greece uh, that, pre that was in the middle of the, the Great Recession. Um, but we haven't seen the sort of things that we would expect to see. Uh, uh, for example, when I went to, when I was in school taking economics, one of the first rules is that big government spending uh, also pushes up interest rates, crowds out private investment, causes inflation, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't seen that. The reason we haven't seen that is because uh, during the Great Recession, but also now during the pandemic, the Federal Reserve has been buying up uh, our debt um, so that we could continue to offer that debt at bot rock bottom interest rates. Um, that works uh, only as long as investors in our debt uh, believe that this is a temporary policy. Um, if somehow this was to be normalized in some capacity and instead we start using the Federal Reserve to just monetize our deficits on an annualized basis, um, investors are gonna drop, they're not going to, they're not gonna demand dollars anymore. Um, and with that, our currency drops and with that in inflation rises. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, I know people probably have heard the buzzword of late is, is modern monetary theory. I think we're all sort of wondering if we're in one of those uh, experiments right now and to, to see how this plays out. Um, yeah, I think inflation is definitely something that's on everybody's mind. Um, I would like to point out that one of the interesting things uh, uh, about the, the Congressional Budget Office's uh, budget update last week um, is that uh, the update going from uh, uh, March to September, um, it added about $2 trillion to our debt over the 10 year window. Um, it would have been another $2 trillion higher. Uh, but the reason why it wasn't is because CBO significantly wrote down their forecast for interest rates, at least over the next five or so years in the short term interest rates, um, a big drop in, in interest rates. So, um, you know, there's, there's this feeling that we're going to benefit from low interest rates, low inflation for a while, uh, but we're not sure uh, how long and how long that, that, that can be sustained. I don't know if that answers your question, but if I knew exactly when inflation was going to rear its head, I'd be playing the market. <laughs> well, Alan, Alan is in a bank. He's vice president of commercial lending for one of our large banks up here. So he's just trying to get the inside information on when uh, when uh, interest rates are, are, are going to take off. But it, it, it is, uh, it's a very uh, important question. Well, and I also, it, it may be, it may be never. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that, that, that's sort of problematic when you're 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 upset about debt and deficits and trying to get people to, to pay attention to your issue. Um, you look at some of the unique factors about the United States. You know, we're, we're the the largest economy, democratic economy. Um, we have normally <laughs> a, a peaceful transfer of power. We have a stable currency, a stable economy. Um, you know, so there are extenuating factors that we benefit from that other nations do not necessarily benefit from. Um, and I think we also exist in an environment right now where everybody's experiencing the same problem we are. Um, so we're like, we're not the worst of the worst, right? We, we have sort of the same problem everybody else does. Um, so whether these unique factors about, you know, the size of our economy, it's a free economy, it's a democratic economy, economy peaceful transfer of power, government doesn't step in and, and buy industry, um, you know, stable currency, uh, 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 you know, a, a lot of investments uh, around the globe are dollar denominated. Uh, the dollar is the reserve currency. You know, those are sort of special, those are things that make our economy special. I just don't know if they're big enough and they will last long enough to ensure that we will never really have a problem with uh, an interest rate spike or high inflation. I, I, think it's, I think it's arrogant to think that that will never happen, but I can understand perhaps why some people might think that. Yeah, I had a, I was at another conference, uh, video conference about a week ago, and 
somebody was addressing this question and they said, it doesn't matter until it does and then it matters a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, if, if, we, if we lose uh, the reserve currency status or if uh, interest rates start taking off or if uh, inflation starts taking off, uh, given the fiscal situation we put ourselves in, given the lack of fiscal space we have to deal with it, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna be, uh, there aren't gonna be that many tools to, 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 to pull it back. Exactly. Um, well, we're at the 45 minute mark, uh, and I promise the Alaskans that that's, a, that's about what we would, uh, how long we would go. So let me wrap it up and, and then uh, give it back to Phil. From, from our perspective, thank you very much again for, for uh, joining us here online in Alaska, allowing us to, uh, to Alaskans to, to understand a little bit about what's going on um, in DC. Thank you to the Concord Coalition. Uh, for those who follow Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, you know that every week uh, when we post our podcast, we post it along with the Facing the Future podcast from uh, the Concord Coalition. Uh, and I've learned as much, uh, as much from that as I have from, uh, from anything else uh, in DC about, uh, about the forces at work in DC. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Phil, for allowing us to join you. And thank you for uh, coming to us via video uh, to Alaska.